Of the different advanced capabilities that are coming up, one of the most interesting is the ability to compute on encrypted data. And while there's several ways to do that, about the most elegant and simple is homomorphic encryption, and it's attracted a lot of both theoretical and practical attention. So let's uh, talk about that a bit. So we let ES be an encryption scheme. It could be either symmetric or say symmetric because in the setting of homomorphic encryption, we're interested in both. We'd like to treat them in somewhat of a unified way. To do that, we'll write EK for the encryption key and DK for the decryption key with the understanding that in the symmetric case, they're just the same. In the asymmetric case, they're whatever the key generation algorithm outputs and are not the same. We'll need an additional key called the homomorphic evaluation key, which we denote by HK. And we simply define it to be the encryption key in the asymmetric case and the empty string in the symmetric case. And it will be public. Homomorphism is defined relative to a class of functions, which is a set of functions. FC stands for function class. Think of them as functions on messages that map messages to other messages. Now, as mathematical objects, they're functions, but they will also have descriptions and will denote this angle bracket of F for such a description. This, for example, could be as a circuit or as a program in some programming language like Python. An encryption scheme becomes homomorphic when it possesses an algorithm called a homomorphic evaluation algorithm relative to the class of functions which parameterizes this definition. How does it work or what does it mean for this algorithm to be homomorphic? Let's consider some messages m1 through m little m. And let's consider a function in the class and assume that function has this many inputs. So you can apply it to this list of messages and you'll get a result, which is f of f m1 through mm. What homomorphic evaluation says is, rather than doing this evaluation on the plain text space, we're going to do it in the ciphertext space. What that means is we'll start by encrypting the messages m1 through mn and get ciphertext. The homomorphic evaluation algorithm, which takes the homomorphic evaluation key, it takes a description of the function f and then these ciphertexts, and it returns another ciphertext. What it's managed to do, however, is inside the encryption, evaluate the function in the sense that C is an encryption of f of m1 through mn. Another way of saying that is if I were to decrypt the ciphertext C returned by the homomorphic evaluation, the message m I get would be f applied to the original messages. So there's two ways to say that again. You could either say C is an encryption of f of m1 through mm, or the decryption of C is f of the decryptions of the original messages. So again, homomorphic evaluation is in the ciphertext space. The inputs are all ciphertext, and so is the output. But the condition on it is stated in terms of the decryptions of these ciphertexts. When we say an encryption scheme is homomorphic for a certain class of functions, we mean that it's possible to design a homomorphic encryption algorithm with this capability for all the functions in the class. And that encryption, that homomorphic evaluation algorithm is required to be efficient. In asymptotic terms, it means it's required to be polynomial time. Now, of course, you can have homomorphism in this way possible for many different classes of functions. And as that class of functions gets richer, this gets more interesting. And a fully homomorphic encryption scheme is kind of the ultimate endpoint here. It's one where this function class is all functions. You can homomorphically evaluate on any function of messages. And that's a pretty magical and remarkable kind of object. Before we try to build homomorphic encryption schemes, let's try to understand the homomorphic evaluation requirement a little better. And one question one may have here is, 
Isn't homomorphic evaluation always possible? Why don't we design a homomorphic evaluation algorithm as follows? It has input the sequence of ciphertext and a function f, and it has the homomorphic evaluation key. And its job is to output a ciphertext that encrypts the result of f applied to the decryptions of these ciphertexts. So why don't we simply obtain the decryptions of these ciphertexts by running the decryption algorithm on these ciphertexts to get messages? Once we have those, we can run f on those and get the message m. And then if we just encrypt m with our encryption algorithm, we would get the ciphertext that homomorphic evaluation is supposed to return. What's wrong with that is first, homomorphic evaluation is not given the decryption key. It's given the homomorphic evaluation key, which remember is the encryption key in the asymmetric case and the empty string in the symmetric case. So it can't do this. And indeed, we don't, we would not think of doing something like this as desirable from the point of view of computing on encrypted data. But the next thing one might consider is why doesn't this algorithm figure out the decryption key from whatever it's given and then do this? Well, that's precluded by the requirement that the algorithm is efficient. So, and that means it's infeasible for it to break the encryption scheme and compute the decryption key from the homomorphic evaluation key. So when you have all this, you kind of see that it is a non-trivial requirement. The next uh, consideration we should have, since we are looking at a possibly new notion, is security. What are our security requirements? And in that sense, at first cut, at least, homomorphic encryption is quite simple because security is unchanged. The primary requirement is simply continues to be INDCPA. And in that perspective, whether or not you can homomorphically evaluate is not connected to security and doesn't impact it. In particular, the presence of a homomorphic evaluation algorithm doesn't violate INDCPA because it operates on ciphertext. Nonetheless, there are times where in the context of homomorphic evaluation, we would be interested in additional security properties. And we can consider a few of those. One of them is what's called function hiding. What this means is, Suppose I homomorphically evaluate a certain function f on a certain sequence of ciphertext encrypting messages m1 through mm. I would like that an adversary, given the ciphertext, doesn't know what function I used. And um, if so, it's function hiding. We have to formalize that properly and we'll actually do that. Something else, which is in fact a little stronger, is to look at the distribution of homomorphically evaluated ciphertexts and ask that they be the same as that of normally encrypted messages. So suppose that we run homomorphic evaluation on encryptions of these messages m1 through m with a function f and get a ciphertext. Well, I know that this ciphertext encrypts f applied to m1 through m. But potentially, it doesn't look like a normal encryption of those. In other words, if I ran f on those messages and directly encrypted, would it look similar or different? Well, the requirement of this definition would be you can't tell which of these two things you got. So um, let's now formalize the function hiding requirement. Towards that, it's useful to uh, develop our notation a little. And as indicated earlier, we're interested here in both symmetric and asymmetric encryption schemes. And our scheme could be either. And in order to simplify and kind of unify notation, I'll define something called an extended key generation algorithm denoted k bar. It's defined differently depending on whether our scheme is symmetric or asymmetric. In either case, it will return an encryption key and a decryption key and a homomorphic evaluation key. But in the symmetric case, 
The first two are the key of the symmetric encryption scheme, while the second is the last is the empty string. In the asymmetric case, they are the first two are whatever the key generation algorithm produces, and the last is the encryption key. We want this quantity to be public, so in the symmetric case, we cannot put either key in it, but in the asymmetric case, we'd like to put the encryption key. This will just be helpful to allow us in the this definition here to kind of compactly deal with both the symmetric and asymmetric cases. So we'll let ES now be an encryption scheme, either symmetric or asymmetric, and assume it is ha does have a homomorphic evaluation algorithm for a certain class of functions. And I want to define what it means for the homomorphic evaluation to hide the function. So here's the game. The game is parameterized not just by the encryption scheme, but also by the homomorphic evaluation algorithm, since effectively it's its security we are, we're trying to measure here. So initialize picks a random challenge bit, initializes a counter to zero, generates all these three keys by the extended key generation, and returns to the adversary the homomorphic evaluation key. The adversary now can call an encryption oracle on any message of its choice. What does the game do? It records the message, it increments the counter and stores this as the ith message. It encrypts the message normally with the encryption algorithm under the encryption key to get a ciphertext C sub i, which also it stores and also returns to the adversary. So all that the adversary can do via this is effectively create a pool of ciphertexts inside the game. It knows them and the game indexes them. What are they for? They will be used in the left or right oracle. Here, the adversary says, I want to submit two functions, f0 and f1, as my challenges. And each of them applies to m messages, which m they will be pointed to by indexes into the pool. These indexes designate some messages which exist from encryption queries. That allows the game to retrieve the corresponding ciphertext. Now here it runs homomorphic evaluation on those ciphertexts, but the function it picks it depends on the challenge bit, either f0 or f1, whereas the ciphertexts are the same independent of what b is. The result of that will be c, and that's returned to the adversary. And the adversary, of course, is being challenged to say, do you think I evaluated on F0 or do you think I evaluated on F1? It outputs its guess in that regard, a bit B prime, and it wins if that guess matches the challenge bit. Okay, so that's our game. Now, a little more details about it. The left or right queries in this game, remember, consist of a sequence of indexes into the encryption message pool, and our two challenge functions. They must satisfy some restrictions. First off, you're only allowed, of course, to query functions in the function class for which homomorphic evaluation works. That should be kind of implicit. Second, both the functions should have m inputs, and m then is the number of indexes over here. Of course, the messages corresponding to such inputs indexes must exist. Encryption queries for those indexes must have been made, which entails that they lie in the range from one to the current value of the counter i. And this is the final requirement that's kind of the most important. We know that the result of homomorphic evaluation of F0 will be an encryption of this message, correspondingly for F1 of this message. I want those two messages to have the same length, because remember, encryption is not going to hide the length. So the ciphertext coming out may not encrypt the same messages, but the lengths of the messages are required to be the same. Okay, and with all that understood, as usual, we define an advantage. And what it is, is since this is a guessing game, not the probability the game returns true, but two times that minus one.
parameterized here by the encryption scheme and homomorphic evaluation algorithm, FH stands for function hiding. Okay, so we might be interested in this at some points. Continuing our study of security, if you recall, when we studied encryption, we had a stronger notion than INDCPA. We also had INDCCA, security against chosen ciphertext attack. So it would be natural to ask in our current context, why don't we target that rather than having said that our requirement is INDCPA and possibly other um, new things. The answer is that no homomorphic encryption scheme can possibly achieve INDCCA. To put it a little more precisely, it does depend on the class of functions for which homomorphic evaluation is possible. But as long as that class of functions is even a little bit non-trivial, there's something non-trivial in it, we will be able to find attacks violating INDCCA. So let's illustrate. So I'm going to create or state some requirement on the function family. And that is that our adversary can find a pair of messages which satisfy these conditions. Uh, there's some function f in the class for which f on m0 is distinct from m0 and correspondingly for m1. And that just means f is not the identity um, on these two messages. It's a very mild requirement. I also want that f on the two messages yields different things. So what might be an example of such a function? Well, if you're thinking about, say, integers mod something, just plus one. If you're thinking of bits, messages are bit strings, f of x is the bitwise complement of x. And as you can see from that, like pretty much any reasonable choice will give you these conditions. So it's a very, very mild condition. But nonetheless, the moment this condition is true, our adversary can be constructed to always violate INDCCA. How does it do that? We have fixed our two messages. They're the ones over here. And remember, our INDCCA adversary has a left or right oracle. Its job is to figure out whether that's encrypting left or right message. So it queries it with our two messages, and it gets a ciphertext. And it now wants to know, does that encrypt M0 or M1? Now, what's the obvious way to determine that? It would go to the decryption oracle and submit this ciphertext. If the description oracle returns M0, we're in the left game. If it returns M1, we're in the right game. But that would not be a violation of INDCCA because the game precludes our submitting this to the decryption oracle. That's just not allowed. Our adversary gets around that by creating an alternative ciphertext by homomorphically evaluating this function f here on the given ciphertext here. Okay, so it runs homomorphic evaluation and gets C prime. So what do we know about C prime? We know that its decryption is f applied to whatever C encrypts. But we can actually obtain that decryption. We have a decryption oracle, so we get it. It's M prime. Now we know that M prime is F applied to what? Either M1 or M0, depending on which bit underlies this challenge ciphertext over here. So I can test. If M prime is F of M1, it must be that uh, the challenge bit was 1, and otherwise I'll return 0. So that's my adversary. So now let's quickly check that it works, and we see that it entails two things, and this is where we're going to exploit our two conditions and assumptions over here. First, remember that for this decryption query to be valid in the game, this ciphertext must be different from this. How can we ensure that? Well, one thing that will certainly ensure it is that the decryption of C prime is different from the decryption of C, right? Because then the correctness of the encryption scheme says that it's impossible for C prime to equal C. How do I guarantee that these things are different decryptions? Well, if C encrypted M0, then C prime would encrypt F of M0, but F of M0 is not M0. If C encrypted F M1, C prime would encrypt f of m1, but f of m1 is not m1. 
And so those two things together tell us this. The second is in actually a little more obvious that this output is correct. Why is that? Well, certainly if C encrypted M1, M prime would be F of M1 and this would trigger and we would return one. The more delicate thing is that how do we know we return zero when C encrypts M uh, zero? In that case, M prime will be F of M zero, right? But we need to ensure that this doesn't trigger. The reason for that is these two messages are different. So F of M zero appearing here would mean this would not trigger and so we would return zero. Okay, so the takeaway is that as long as you have a non-trivial function class, we have to give up on CCA security. Okay, so how would we use homomorphic encryption? Well, this is something that's quite um, popular now in, in practice. Industry has a lot of interest in it and possible applications. And one of these which embodies this computing on encrypted data idea is that you have a user like Alice who picks the keys and encrypts her own data under the encryption key to get certain ciphertext. And then she uploads the ciphertext to the cloud. So this is just sort of typical cloud storage scenario. But for the privacy of her data, she uploads it in encrypted form. Now, uh, when she wants to compute some function on her data, um, rather than downloading everything, decrypting and computing it, she's going to ask the server to perform a homomorphic evaluation. And this will save Alice a lot of work. She can send the description of the function to the server B. And the server is already equipped with the homomorphic evaluation key. It runs homomorphic evaluation algorithm on the desired function with that, on whatever ciphertexts are pointed to by this function, and sends the resulting ciphertext back to Alice. But Alice knows the decryption key, so she will decrypt that, and her, the result is she has what she wants, which is the result of F on her data. So you might think of this as database queries or many other things like that. Of course, this is a bit of a abstract setting and um, real usage could be uh, different from that. So let's now turn to how we might realize homomorphic encryption, how we build these schemes. And of course, it's going to depend a lot on the class of functions for which we want to have the homomorphic evaluation capability. And so we'll begin modestly I'm going to want to evaluate homomorphically the XOR function. So, um, and the claim is that we already have ways of doing that. In other words, we have existing schemes, in particular counter mode encryption, which I claim is XOR homomorphic. So let's see why that's the case. So remember that counter mode is based on a family of functions which is PRF secure. It has a k-bit key, inputs of a certain length little l, outputs of a certain length big L. I'm going to recall the scheme, but uh, write it a little differently in terms of an auxiliary function g. g takes a key for f, and remember in counter mode, we begin by picking at random a starting point. Based on that, we generate a sequence of points r plus 1 r to r plus the number of blocks in the message, which here will be this. And so this function g outputs this sequence. Remember plus here is means um, I convert this to an integer, add 1 modulo 2 to the l, convert back to a string and so forth. So now think of this as a pad whose length will be um, n um, bits corresponding to a message of n over l blocks. So now let's write the counter mode symmetric encryption scheme. No change, it's us, the scheme we know and love from before, but it's done in terms of g. Encryption takes the key k and a message m, whose length we assume is a multiple of um, big L. 
we pick our little r at random from strings of length little l. We let little n be the length of the message. And we generate our pad from the function g and XOR the message to it. The ciphertext is this XOR value, but we also include this R value because that's needed for decryption. How does decryption work? It gets these two. It recovers from this the length of the message. Then it can create the pad through the G function since it knows the key. We're in the symmetric setting and it knows R to plug in here. If you XOR this back in, you get the message. Okay, so nothing new there. Now, here's what we notice. What do we want to do for this homomorphic evaluation? I would like to change or offset the message by XORing some value delta. So I want to manipulate the ciphertext so that if you decrypt, the message you get is offset by delta. And that's quite simple to do. If I've created an encryption of a message m and I have my delta, I just add it to this x over here, right? And call the result y. So now I have ry, which is a ciphertext. Well, look what happens when I decrypt it. According to the decryption algorithm, the decryption will consist of applying this function to r and the length of the message and then adding in the y component here. But that y, um, when we add it in, it will it will result in in this because we created y as x plus delta. Now if we look at this equation, we see that this part is just the message m. And so the result is that the decryption of this ciphertext is our original message XORed with delta. So in other words, put a little bit more simply, simply adding an offset delta to a ciphertext, technically part of the ciphertext, will result in adding delta to m. And the algebra is quite simple. So um, how do we kind of encapsulate that into an actual um, description of a homomorphic evaluation algorithm? Um, for some notation, let's let b be the uh, space of blocks. So messages are strings over this, um, are elements of this and hence strings over this. That is, they have length a multiple of big L. If I want to claim the scheme is homomorphic, I need to have some class of functions fc relative to which I'm making that claim. So what is the class of functions? For every string delta, I'm going to define a function f delta. Its inputs and outputs are of the same length as delta itself. And all it does is it adds delta into the input to get the output. So very simple. And our class of functions is all of these, as this ranges over all strings in this space over here, which is effectively over all possible messages. For homomorphic evaluation, we already also need to pick a representation. But given that I only have functions of this form, I'll do that in a very simple way. Let's just describe the function by the string delta itself. So now we let ES be our counter mode symmetric encryption scheme as above. And here's the homomorphic al evaluation algorithm. It gets the homomorphic evaluation key since we're in the symmetric setting, that's the empty string gets a description of the function, which is delta, and a ciphertext c. We know this ciphertext will have length, the input length to f, plus um, uh, delta over here. So we parse it this way, where the first part has length l, and we can see the rest as a member of this set over here. And all we do is we offset that second part by delta and return the first part unchanged, and this new second part as our ciphertext. And what we said before said, if you decrypt this, the result is the decryption of, um, of this ciphertext offset by delta. 
That was a symmetric scheme. Um, it turns out it's equally simple to give an asymmetric encryption scheme that's also homomorphic for the same class of functions, meaning for offsetting by um, the XOR with a constant. So we could do that over uh, a cyclic group, meaning we would base this on the hardness of the, of the Diffie-Hellman problem. So let G be a cyclic group, little g a generator, and M the order of the group, and we let H be some hash function with n bit outputs. And our scheme is effectively uh, based on the uh, Diffie-Hellman CPA key encapsulation mechanism, except that we are actually going to not encapsulate keys, but encrypt messages. So it should look fairly familiar. What key generation does is it does whatever one usually does in the discrete log setting. The secret key is a random exponent and the public key big X is the group element that's g to that power. Since we're in the asymmetric setting, encryption takes the public key, oracle access to our hash function, and a message whose length we assume is the same as the output length of the hash function. As usual in a Diffie-Hellman type scheme, encryption will pick a random exponent and raise g to that power to get big Y, which will pop into the ciphertext. Looking ahead, um, everything will be based on the Diffie-Hellman key, z, which can be computed in two ways, big X to the little y, or in decryption, big Y to the little x. So now encryption will take that Diffie-Hellman key, prepend this y to it, hash that, and simply XOR the message m into it. And that w will be put into here. Decryption has the secret key little x, retrieves the Diffie-Hellman key by raising y to the power little x, hashes the pair y and z, and adds that back to w, which reverses this equation to get back the message. So that's fine, that's an encryption scheme, and it's not hard to see that this does satisfy INDCPA in the random oracle model for the hash function, as long as the computational Diffie-Hellman problem is hard in the group. But what we now notice is this has a homomorphic property. Suppose I have an encryption of a message M, which is a pair like this. If I want to add delta into M homomorphically, all I need to do is modify this part by adding delta into it. So I replace that W by W plus delta. And you can see that this works. If I decrypt this new ciphertext, um, according to decryption, I will evaluate H on this Y, on the Diffie-Hellman key, which is Y to the power of the decryption key, and add um, in this thing here. But this is just W plus delta, so write it like that. And now I look at this part, and that's simply what would come from decrypting our original ciphertext over here. So we know this to be M and so I get m plus delta. But in some ways, the equations make it look even harder than it is. It's kind of relatively clear that if I offset del w by delta, when you decrypt, your message will be offset by delta. Again, if we want to turn that into a more precise claim, we need to specify a family of functions, uh, function class rather, and then a homomorphic evaluation algorithm relative to that class. So as before, the class we consider is the functions are associated to strings delta. And what they do is they take a message and they XOR this delta into it. And the class of functions is all these as this delta ranges over all n bit strings. As before, we can represent the function just by delta. Now consider the scheme we had above, and we will give the following homomorphic evaluation algorithm. It needs the public key, and it will get as input the description of the function, which here is delta, and a ciphertext, which is a pair. We know from the scheme description that the length of the second part is the output length of the hash function, n. How do we homomorphically evaluate? We just XOR delta into this part of the ciphertext, leave this part unchanged, and return that. 
and all we said said it works so good we have two examples here and effectively what these show is that it's quite simple to get homomorphic encryption but that's if we had as target to do it for a class of functions fc that wasn't terribly ambitious it's just xor now before we move on a little bit about security so the two schemes we saw above are certainly INDCPA secure. And as we said, the primary requirement for a homomorphic encryption scheme is simply to retain the INDCPA security we additionally expect. We did define this additional function hiding security, but our schemes don't provide that. And as a little puzzle, you might try to show that by giving attacks. So that would mean specify adversaries for these schemes above that achieve a function hiding advantage of one um, for those schemes. So um, moving on from there, we would be interested in growing the set of operations or growing the function class with respect to which we can do homomorphic encryption and homomorphic evaluation. It turns out that classically for many years as cryptography was developed, we were aware of many examples of encryption schemes that were homomorphic for operations kind of like what we saw. More generally, they were group operations, either addition or multiplication over different groups. But what had remained an open problem for a long time and, and may have even been thought impossible was to get a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. That is, it could homomorphically evaluate any function of the message. And so it was a really interesting sort of surprising development when in 2009 Craig Gentry actually gave the first such scheme. Since then it's been simplified and there have been many other such schemes and I point here to one sort of relatively recent example which is relatively simple to, to read and study. We're not going to look at how these schemes work really but if you want a glimpse of it, they're based on kind of encryption being a linear function created by matrix multiplication. And um, then what you do is you, you give homomorphic evaluation methods for addition and multiplication operations on simple one-bit messages. And then as that class of operations is complete, you can build up to evaluate all functions. The security relies on the hardness of problems like learning with errors, which is connected to the hardness of lattice-based problems. And the security here will just be INDCPA. If you want more information about this, there is a couple of blog posts that give quite nice overviews, overviews and there are um, pointers to them here. And there are also many um, libraries that um, implement homomorphic encryption. So if this lets us, we could go look at those. So here is um, a list of libraries on this web page, which is called Awesome Homomorphic Encryption. And you can see that there's really been quite a slew of them. And this is a representation of how interesting homomorphic encryption is for industry and practice these days. There are toolkits, applications, and other resources that they've um, linked to over here. And um, similarly, if you're interested in these blog posts, um, they occur on this um, uh, blog over here. And uh, they're written in quite an engaging and accessible way. They tell you what homomorphic encryption is, um, some of its applications and usages, some of which we'll get to, others we won't. And then in the second post, they tell you a little bit more about how um, these things work.